It's so. interesting that it says that. I just noticed when we we're reading it again now. Yeah. That um, it says that Matsya was the first incarnation. So how is there a first incarnations when the incarnations are all eternal? <laughs> That's a good, good question. Um, I think, well, I think it's it's referring to the Das Avatar, right? Well, that and also he is definitely the first in Das Avatar. Then it was asked why is he the first in the Das Avatar? I mean, if you look at it from the span of the Manus, uh, you know, Manus uh, sort of uh, chronology, like in in there are uh, four. But 14 Manus in each day of Brahma, and the first one is Vayambhuva Manu. And Matsya actually appeared, uh, you know, during the time of the Vayambhuva Manu. So that could also be a reason why to consider the first. Uh, this is the first in this particular time and space. <laughs> yeah, in this particular day of Brahma. Yeah. You know, so from that perspective. Mm. Well, That's a very good answer. Thank you. I wouldn't have known the answer to that. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's a, you know, some form of guess, but hopefully it's the right, you know. Right, uh, good thing we're giving Bob some class together. <laughs> okay. So um, okay, the so people who want to be admitted to the room, Gorish, uh, should I just admit them? No, I'm, I'm, I've done it. Okay. okay. I'm taking care of it. Even after I press, you will keep seeing it. So don't oh, worry. Okay. Um, a few minutes to update it. Okay, go ahead. Let's talk about Krishna now. Okay, I mean, my, well, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that um, many religious traditions of the world, including the Vedic tradition, also say that the Lord, say that God, you know, like Abrahamic traditions, like Islam, is very strict on this that God cannot have any partners. God cannot, God is unborn. He has no father, He has no mother. Um, and there's no possibility whatsoever for Him to take, uh, you know, make his appearance in the world as a human being, what to speak of a fish. Okay, so, so, so they say that it is because God is high above all of these mundane things. And therefore, when, for example, when they hear of the Lord taking, uh, you know, pastimes, you know, like form, taking the form of avatar, uh, you know, they, they, they don't understand it. So my question is like, the so thing I want to discuss is how is the Lord unborn? In, in, in Sanskrit, we call uh, uh, thing is the word Aja, unborn. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's also descending in this material world. How is he unborn and, and born at the same time? Are you asking me that question? I mean, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so. It actually reminds me of the verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I think it's the sixth or seventh verse, how it says that Lord Chaitanya appeared from the womb of Srimati Sachi Devi as the full moon appears on the ocean. That mm -hmm. it's like that Krishna or Lord Chaitanya or any of his incarnations appear to appear. And they appear to, to be born and yet uh, and as it, like as part of his leela, he is born, like actually comes out of like someone's womb, his eternal associate's womb. But um, when most people take birth, they don't take birth like Krishna, like with all of the ornaments. <laughs> all, all, <laughs> Krishna was covered with uh, as as Vishnu came out of um, um, Devaki's womb, covered in you know gold and jewels and. And everything. So, I mean, just like the, the moon sun. is always there. So the moon, yeah. I was gonna. Yeah, go ahead. Because because you brought the moon. Yeah, I was gonna finish. Yeah. <laughs> the, both the sun and the moon are are always existing, but you don't always see them just because the sun. So the sun rises and it sets um, beyond our our vision. Um, but just because the sun is setting doesn't mean it's actually disappearing. And just because the sun is rising doesn't mean it's just being born no. in the same way Krishna appears in yeah. his various incarnations. And also to say that God cannot um, take birth or descent is also limiting the powers of God. So if you really accept that God is all powerful, then you must also accept that he's unborn and yet he can be born as well simultaneously. 
Um, and one of the names of the Lord is, you know, sometimes when we in the Brahma Samhita, it says, Fantastico, Tisatavatsara, Sampragam, Yogvayo, Ratapi, Manasomu, Nipungavanam, So Piastia, Prapada, Cynthia, Vichintia, Tatve, Govinda, Mahavi, Purusham, Mahamajam. So Achintya Tatve, that even the great Munis and Rishis uh, who can travel with the speed of the mind or the wind, they cannot understand the Lord by approaching them with their own senses. His, his, his achinta tatwe means his, 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 his inconceivable. And another name for the Lord is also adhokshaja. He cannot be perceived by uh, material senses. So it is difficult for us to um, conceive, you know, with our own mind, how someone can be unborn and born at the same time. But the, since the Lord is all powerful, like Prabhupada is mentioned in, in the Prabhupada here, he can do it by his inconceivable uh, energies. And that analogy he gave of the moon um, and, the, and, and the sun uh, yeah, is a great way to help us understand that. If I was going to speculate about God, then I think it would make more sense, speculatively speaking, that because the concept of God is that God is great, God is all powerful, then we don't want to compare, we don't, like, for us to actually, like, be able to conceive, begin to try to conceive of how great and powerful God is, then we would have to speculate by saying that, no, God, it doesn't make sense for God to take birth. But that's why it's so wonderful that we have our self-realized teachers and our uh, wonderful Shastra to explain very logically to help um, us understand the truth of the matter, how Krishna uh, can simultaneously be God um, and at the same time perform these beautiful leelas of, of having uh, parents for, for the sake of loving exchanges. Um, so a lot of these things, I feel like it's we, we have to be so grateful to to our gurus for helping us to see the light <laughs> and under, and understand um, that it the simultaneously the, the truth and how the truth makes sense that God can appear from someone's womb and yet at the same time is is never born. I was thinking also because it's mentioned the avatars to speak a little bit about the different types of incarnations. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 So there's unlimited incarnations, it is said, um, by the Shastra. And yet those, it gets, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it gets super technical. So we're not going to go that deep <laughs> because I can't even completely carp compartmentalize all of the different types of um, incarnations and avatars and everything, but there's like six main uh, categories of, of avatars. And um, the type of avatar that Matsya is, is the Leela avatar or the avatar or incarnation of the Lord that comes um, to perform different pastimes. So all of the Matsya is considered the first of the Das avatar that tend um, and and the, those are all examples of, of Leela, Leela avatars. Um, Nishingadev, Korma, um, I can't think straight right now. What is, name some other ones? Vamanadev. Vamanadev, even uh, Kalki. Yeah, Kalki. But so they're all, well, but Kalki's also, is he a Yuga avatar also? Or? No, okay. Oh, no. Um, so uh, Leela avatars, there's more than 10, but the Das avatar considered within the Leela avatars. I'm telling you, it gets so technical. That's why I can't remember all of it. Um, but um, so that's where Krishna comes to perform specific pastimes. And in the case of Mati avatars, we will inform you if you don't already know about his pastimes, he came specifically to do certain activities, which will be revealed in time. And then there's the Purusha avatars, which are the, the three Vishnus 
Garba Dakshai Vishnu, Kshira Dakshai Vishnu, and Karana Dakshai Vishnu, who all chill out and lay on their different oceans um, and contribute to the creation of the universe and the sustenance of the universe as well. Um, and uh, then there's the Guna avatars who are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Um, <clears throat> and again, so not, not every avatar has uh, the complete aspect of the personality of Godhead. A lot of them display different partial aspects. And so obviously, you know, Brahma is considered to be just an ordinary Jiva in one sense, but he's taking the post um, of uh, one of these um, guna avatars and they're called guna avatars referring to the guna as the modes of material nature because each of the three are in charge are kind of like overseeing one of the different modes of natures. Um, and then there's the uh, yuga avatars, which is there's a, a different avatar for each of the four yugas um, and they're characterized by their different colors. There's the uh, uh, red, white, yellow, and blue avatar, right? Or black, black, black. Sorry, I was thinking Krishna. Yes, blue, black. white, red, and uh, black. black. And sometimes yellow is or it's mentioned with Kali Yuga as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's the Manvanpars, who are the uh, 14 Manus. Um, put in charge of the creation of, you know, the, not the creation, Brahma's in charge of creation, but in charge of like uh, increasing the population. And then there's the Shaktivesh avatars and that category gets even more confusing because um, as I mentioned with Brahma, similarly speaking, there um, can be uh, jivas within the category of jiva and yet they're considered avatar they're considered um incarnations of the lord because they're um personally empowered by krishna to perform a specific um service usually to you know help elevate people like for example Srila Prabhupada actually um <clears throat> said that jesus was in a shaktivesh avatar personally empowered by krishna to help bring people um, back to the path of devotional service. And um, many people say that Srila Prabhupada himself, and you can see based on his activities that he very much has the qualities of a Shaktivesh avatar as well. Um, and so, uh, because, uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, talking about avatars and why he appears, Parichranaya sadunam vinashayacha duskritam dharma samstarpanartaya sampavam yuge yuge. That um, whenever there's a decline in religious principles and uh, an increase in irreligion, that he says he appears himself. Um, just to um, reestablish the principles of religion. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and to help out his devotees. So um, he's, he comes himself, but he also sends uh, his representatives in the form of Shaktivesh avatars to reestablish these religious principles. So anyways, um, Anything else you wanted to mention about the avatar? Should I go ahead and tell the past time? Yeah, I mean, so I think she's going to tell the story of uh, Matsya, but just a little bit of a prelude. Interestingly, Matsya avatar is probably among the 10. He's, he's the one who is um, least depicted by himself. Usually, you know, when, when, when he's depicted, you, you usually will see him when he's depicted along with the 10 avatars, but very seldom, like uh, when you compare to like Vamana Dev uh, or Varaha Dev and Narsinga Dev, it's not very often you'll see uh, a deity or a temple of Matsya, you know, that's uh, somehow he's, you know, for some reason, he's not so uh, worshipped singularly. Um, yeah, but, but still or depicted in art. 
um, but still he's, uh, you know, one of the 10 incarnations and uh, very interestingly he's mentioned as the first of the 10 incarnations. Um, and uh, so I think Tulsi Rani will now tell us um, the pastime of uh, Matsya Dev. If anyone wants to know more about the different um, avatars and the different, you know, it's, it's, it's actually extraordinarily fascinating. And me and some of my girlfriends actually had to like draw out a chart while like going through this section of the Chaitanya Charitamrita to try to understand the different compartments of avatars. And it, it's it's very complex and, and, and very telling about the incredible complex nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and how he's trying so hard through so many different avenues to help us come back to him. Um, so now we'll tell the pastime of Matsya Dev. So Matsya Avatar, once upon a time, there was a demon named Hayagriva. And um, while Lord Brahma was taking rest at the end of the day during a partial devastation, because of um, partial devastation happens at the end of the day of Brahma, all of the living entities enter into his body. Is that correct? Into, sometimes it's said that the living entities enter into Mahavishnu, or is that just at the utter devastation that all the living entities enter into Mahavishnu's body? No, uh, they enter into Brahma. Uh, but when Brahma is sleeping, I think, do they just enter into Brahma's body? Not sure. Okay, we're not sure. Um, so the living, enter, the living entities enter into someone's body, either Brahma or or. Mahavishnu's body. Maybe Gorshran can correct us on what the actual truth is. We don't want to speak mistruths to when we're giving a Bhagavatam class, though, um, or any time. <laughs> but um, so the living entities are sleeping while Brahma is sleeping, and there's the partial devastation. And at the end of Brahma's life, there's what's called the utter devastation. So during the devastation, there's um, a lot of rainfall and the uh, oceans all over flood and pretty much like all of the, not just the planet, but all of the, the universes that that particular Brahma is in charge of um, just become <laughs> flooded pretty much while the living entities sleep and while Lord Brahma sleeps. So while this is happening, uh, the Vedas were somehow emanating from the uh, mouth of Brahma. So the Vedas, it's interesting to know that, that during the devastations, the Vedas are not destroyed. They're contained within this, you know, eternal spiritual knowledge is contained within the body of Brahma. And, but demons, as they like to do, cause chaos and are envious of the pure scriptures, um, came, uh, Hayagriva came and stole the Vedas from the mouth of Brahma while he was sleeping. So Matsya Avatar came. So this incarnation of, of Krishna as a fish, a very large fish, um, came swimming through the waters of the devastation and saved the Vedas. Now there isn't much more um, information on that particular instance of Matsya's appearance, but it's explained that Matsya actually uh, came twice, um, although he exists eternally, but he came for two different, to perform two different leelas. The first one to be to save the Vedas. And the next one was, um, I believe during a different Manu's, I think it was Manu, Chakshusha Manu. Yeah. Um, and, Towards the end of, um, of many, many yuga cycles, when Brahma was about to take his rest for the next devastation to happen, um, Satyavrata um, Maharaj was uh, king at the time, and he was a very pious king, and he was offering um, prayers 
uh, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And one day he went uh, and he was doing, uh, uh, while he was offering prayers, he was also doing uh, Vrata um, a, and performing an austerity and penance of uh, only drinking a little bit of uh, water to sustain himself. He wasn't eating any food in order to attract the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, thank God we have the holy names. And in this day and age, you don't have to just drink a little bit of water. You can run around chanting Hare Krishna all day and all night and eat all the prasadam you want, as long as you can sustain your chanting of Hare Krishna and um, not have to worry about only drinking water. But at the time he was just drinking water to try to attract the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And it worked because one day he was um, in the Kritamala River and offering some uh, water in the back to the river. It's a, a wonderful uh, tradition and, and is very encapsulating of the path of bhakti that uh, the water, the, the river doesn't need any more water, but yet we take the, the water of the river and offer it back to the river as an offering of, of devotion. And so he was doing that. He was taking some palmfuls of water and just offering it back in respect to the, uh, to the river. And while he was doing that, a little tiny fish was caught in his palms and he saw, oh, what a cute little fish. And he, because he was a very merciful and compassionate king, he wanted to take care again, of all of his, all the living entities under his care. He quickly put the fish back into the water because he didn't want to cause it any discomfort while it was caught in his hands. And, uh, but then the fish swam back to him and started speaking. And the fish said, wait a minute, you're, you put me back in this water, but you're supposed to be protecting me. And in this water, there's all kinds of sharks and big fish that are, you know, trying to eat me. So please give me protection and take me out of this water and give me a better place to exist. And Satyavrata was like, oh, okay, of course. Yeah, no problem. So he took the fish home with him and uh, put the fish in just a simple water jug because it was a really small fish. And then the next morning when he woke up, he noticed the next morning, it I was the next morning, okay. I think. Well, because, Hopefully. because later on I see it was, it says all of this took place in one day, but you can check back. Okay, I could be wrong. My brain yeah. is a Kali Yuga brain, so I could very much well be wrong. But I think I read a verse that said overnight the fish grew. You can, here, while, can while I'm telling the pastime, yeah. you, can, yeah. you can check to see if I'm correct. Okay, um, so... Perhaps overnight or at some point in time, <laughs> the fish grew to the size of the water jug. Mm -hmm. And he was very uncomfortable. Was I correct? He says, it says but in one in night. One night fish. he grew. Okay. But then the rest of this. I know. Shh, don't tell. Don't give it away. So in one night, he grew to the size of a water jug. Whether it was overnight or not, that could have been a speculation. I apologize. But in one night, specifically, the Bhagavad Tam says, the fish grew to the size of the water jug. And when the king saw the fish, the fish again spoke to him and said, hey, it's getting a little uncomfortable in here. Can you please give me a larger body of water to live in? Um, and the king was like, of course, you know, let me take care of you. Let me serve you. You're uh, and, you know, also part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he um, put the, the fish in a rather large well and as soon, but then it says in this verse, if I recall correctly, um, that the fish immediately grew to the size with, you know, that he pretty much fit the entire well right away, as soon as he was put in the well. And he was like, wait, nope, no, that's not gonna work either. This well's too small for me still. Um, so the king said, all right, I don't know how he did it. There's no, uh, details of how he moved such a large fish, but somehow or other, he put the fish into a lake. And then immediately the fish took up the entire lake. And the fish again spoke. And he said, you're gonna have to move me to the largest body of water that you have. 
So we moved him again to like the largest body of water that he could find. And again, immediately he grew to be as big and completely filled that um, body of water. And then the king was getting a little, you know, probably exasperated at that point. Like, what is going on here with this fish? I mean, I would have kind, I probably would have had my eyebrows raised when a fish started talking to me. Um, but apparent, it doesn't say anything about him being surprised by a fish talking to him. What really got him was when the fish started growing in size. So he then put the fish in the ocean and the fish expanded himself to the entire ocean. And at that point he was like, okay, <laughs> this fish must be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Can I just, can I just? Yeah, yeah, please. So, well, so when he, he became one of the, you know, um, there's a very nice conversation, ongoing dialogue between Matsya and, and the king throughout. And it's very humorous actually. It's very, very sweet as well. He's, he keeps saying, oh, you know, I've grown so big, you know, can, you know, can you please do something about me? Like he made, he made, he made it seem as if he's dependent on the king to protect him and to take care of him. You know, he gave that, oh, yeah, that kind of a bhava, that kind of rasa that was there. The king has to protect this, you know, this fish that is helplessly growing bigger and bigger. And the, keep, the fish kept saying, Matsya kept, kept saying, oh, please, please, can you take care of me? I need your help to be transferred somewhere else. And eventually when he grew big, you know, the king, king has this word, was translation, my Lord, in one day, you've expanded yourself for hundreds of miles, covering the water of the river and the ocean. Before this, I had never even seen or heard of such an aquatic animal. <laughs> yeah, so aquatic animal. So he's like bewildered that, oh, what's, you know, what happened here, you know? I so, forget how long it actually there's a it says somewhere specifically how big i think it was like I think eight, eight million, million miles was it? okay there. okay I'm glad we got that right eight million miles long okay so i can't even conceive of that but that's because krishna is inconceivable um so anyways um then what happened was matya uh then spoke after uh such a mars began offering beautiful, beautiful prayers, which you'll get to. Again, we're just summarizing this chapter. You'll go deeper into, you know, the meaning of behind all of these different things happening um, as you go through this chapter in the following Bhagavatam classes. But I mean, the prayers offered by Satyavrata Maharaj are actually very relatable from my perspective, really, really sweet prayers explaining about how this material world is a place of suffering, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, please give me the shelter of your lotus feet. Um, but I mean, the prayers are just extraordinary. And, um, and then uh, Matsya said, uh, explained to uh, Satyavrata why he appeared before him. And he said, well, there's going to be this you know, devastation happening within the next week. And I want you to take um, some seeds, some herbs, a uh, variety of different uh, life forms, and especially the sages, the brahmanas, um, and put them all on a boat. And then I'm, you're going to tie that boat to my um, tusk, horn. horn yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Because the Matsya avatar actually has a horn. Um, and so he said, and please just tie the boat to, to my horn. And that way- Using the Vasuki, serpent Vasuki. Yes, is the yes. Celestial leader of all the celestial serpents in Nagaloka. Thank you for that. He's the underworld. Yeah. So using Vasuki to tie the boat to his horn and I mean, at this point, Satyavata Maharaj had already seen a lot and he was like, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but um, <laughs> it's probably not what he said. <laughs> but he's, of course he complied in, in a probably much more respectable and eloquent way than what I just mentioned. And um, so sure enough, Satyavata Maharaj was sit, sat in med meditation waiting for this devastation to take place. The rain started coming, the ocean started swelling, and Satyavata Maharaj collected all of the things that 
Monty Avatar told him to collect. He um, brought all of these onto a boat or some people might call an ark. And then um, Mati Avatar appeared in his beautiful, and Mati Avatar is, was explained that has a beautiful golden complexion. And then he followed the lead of Mati Avatar and tied the boat to his horn. And they sailed probably peacefully because every, he was with the Supreme Personality of Godhead throughout the um, partial devastation. And while this was going on, he continued offering beautiful prayers. And then Matsya uh, reciprocated by explaining all of the Vedas, by explaining the Vedas to um, Satyavrata Maharaj. And it's said that anyone who tells this pastime is um, all of their obstacles are removed and they get to go back to Godhead. So thank you very much for listening to me tell this pastime so that I can go back to Godhead. I appreciate it. <laughs> so um, we have a few minutes. You wanted to mention some other things. Oh well. yeah, no, I think it's also just listen, a lot of the Prabhupada and Prabhupada's quotes of Matsya Purana a lot. I haven't read the Matsya Purana, but I'm sure there's lots of details there. Um, just want to quickly ask this question. Um, you know, this whole story of Matsya, I, mean, I, I like the part how he raised that while he was on the boat, Matsya was giving him, uh, telling him spiritual knowledge. It's like, he, like it, almost like hearing the Bhagavatam class while going on a cruise, you know? So oh my God, that sounds so epic. I love yeah. how you just put that. So, but anyway. From the mouth of the Supreme Personality of God. Exactly. It must have been taken quite a long time. What a nice cruise. Yeah. <laughs> But here's my question very quickly. Uh, it's like, it seems like, you know, the whole story of a fish, you know, talking and then growing bigger every day kind of sounds uh, like a fairy tale, you know? Um, it's easier to, to conceive the Lord coming in like Lord Rama, Chandra or Krishna. It sounds very uh, mythological. So if I have this, so my question is, how am I to accept this, you know, uh, as the factual history uh, to really understand it? Well, my answer is, I mean, I think in the next couple of days, the verse, they're, they're going to be covering this topic more in depth. So I don't want to give it away too much. But the thing is, the problem is, is that we project um, our own experiences onto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in your experience, fish are very smelly and slimy and gross and not very intelligent mm -hmm. um yeah. but you know you're kind of slimy and smelly too and so you're projecting your own idea thank you of thank you my chaste wife uh, for <laughs> saying that in front of uh, how many people 25 people you know it's wonderful well, the wife that you have <laughs> you asked the question <laughs> It's just that it just happens when you have a material wife or a material wife, sorry, a material body. <laughs> the body smells bad. And in one point you had the body of a fish and it probably didn't smell very good, you know? So then we project these, you know, the idea of a, of a, of a brain, you know, an, an unintelligent fish onto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we want to limit the Supreme Person. We want to limit the unlimited by saying that he can't appear in the form of a transcendental fish. And I'm, it doesn't say anything um, in the Bhagavatam, probably in the Matsya Purana, about the smell of Matsya Avatar. But I would highly doubt that he has any ill smell. And obviously, he's the most intelligent whereas fish are generally not very intelligent, but Krishna is the most intelligent being the source, you know, of all the Vedas, the knower of the Vedas and all of that and speaking the Vedas. So obviously, you know, okay, what else do you have to say? So, I mean, just to add to that, you know, the one reason why people of our times and also I think 20th century will generally dismiss this as, as a as a myth is because you know this was sociologist called Max Weber he calls it the time of the he calls it the disenchantment so because you know after the age of enlightenment in Europe you know after the post-Newtonian time you know everything was quantified in terms of numbers figures 
and we, we, we see space as three dimensional and time is chronological, you know, like, uh, like uh, linear. Then what happens is like we're looking into a microscope all the time, you know, with numbers and quantifying everything. And we've almost kind of stuck our eyes to the microscope so that we cannot see what is beyond the microscope. So generally anything that is very difficult beyond that experience, uh, like what it beyond the range of our senses or beyond what we know as a physical law, we have a tendency to uh, dismiss it as a fairy tale or mythological. And the only way to, at least in my perspective, to get out of this is by like Prabhupada, you know, he formed the Bhaktivedanta Institute because he, he said that we should use scientific language. It's like, uh, I can't remember what he said, he's using, um, uh, he gave an analogy of breaking your teeth with a, with a mold for the pestle or something like that. We use the same tools to basically use the same language to uh, uncondition ourselves. So, you know, for example, we can say that physical laws that are generally apply to matter doesn't apply to uh, spiritual subject matters. So in that way, when we, that makes us much more open and receptive to understand and appreciate the pastimes the law, the uncommon pastimes of the law, like Matsya Avatar and so forth. So let's see. Um, we have some comments. Yes. If anyone wants to, at this point, um, uh, ask any questions or make any verbal comments or corrections or chastisements for me being an unchaste wife. And <laughs> my husband really doesn't smell bad. I was just trying to make a point. He smells wonderful. Well, he's not unchaste either. So. <laughs> Hare Krishna. It's so, Hare Krishna. It's so nice to see your interaction and, and also just hear this amazing class. I think it's just very sweet that you're introducing the chapter coming and I'm just very excited to to learn about you know the Matthew incarnation so I, I put it in the chat but I was just very surprised to actually realize that the colors of the yugas are completely aligned with the medicine wheel of the native traditions and um, I mean that's just kind of for me I, I love how the Vedas um, are so reflect in other traditions, just proving them to be the supreme truth. So yeah. that is just absolutely amazing. And then would you just, I mean, from this funny interaction, I was just reminded that by the, at the end of the end of the Nectar of Devotion when Rukmini Devi speaks about her so has so-called husband's body just longing for Krishna. So Rukmini, awesome. interesting. <laughs> interesting parallel. Yeah, there's you'll see you'll see a lot of uh, parallels between. I mean, the the obvious one in this pastime is the parallel of Noah's Ark, and uh, and Matya Avatar asking Satya Vrata Maharaj to collect, you know, living entities and seeds and herbs and stuff to to save for the next part of the next day of Brahma, like that. So it's, yeah, you'll see you you will see. It, it's I, I can't say why it is there, but it m must be some truth there, you know, obviously, then, then we can understand that in, in other religions, I mean, from my perspective, the bhakti tradition is the supreme absolute truth. But mm -hmm. that's um, not to say that there aren't um, tr truths to be found in other religions and great examples of bhakti and and so it, it is always interesting when you find uh, some parallels there in the, the different scriptures, even in terms of like stories, not just philosophy, you know. So anything else? I think waiting, waiting for Radha Morley Dar to. Well, Adi Purusha. Oh, Adi Purusha, please. Yeah, the idea of the Lord not being born but just appearing and you know, eternally existing. And normally we think of born, oh, a child is born, but actually born means like incarcerated. It means like, what is the cause of birth? Our own material desires. Mm -hmm. So we were born, you know, because we just didn't completely desire to serve Krishna completely, but Krishna doesn't come in like that. Just like they give the, Prabhupada gives the analogy. In the prison, you may see so many people locked up but then there might be a lawyer, a social worker, or a doctor, 
who goes in and it looks like he's in prison, but as soon as he goes, all right, they open the door and he can go out. So Krishna's like that. He can come and go. But we are born based on um, some discretion, transgression. Mm, excellent, excellent example. Thank you so 